Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Greg Pashini, started life with a shared NDE with his mother, who was responsible in that experience for saving his life. The event no doubt colored the adventures of his life, though he only recalled it later in a vision beginning while being prayed over in a Benedictine monastery where he'd served as a carpenter and potter. He also had a spontaneous remission of a lung tumor following a spiritually transformative experience. Career-wise, Greg has been a psychotherapist for 43 years, with healing skills as a healing touch practitioner and Reiki master, and for nine years he worked exclusively with the chronically and terminally ill. By contrast, Greg has additionally served as a walk-on for two pro football teams, pursued two vintage motocross national championships, earned a taekwondo black belt, and produced three aired albums of original music. Greg is also the author of two books, Journey Beyond Hardship and Journey Beyond Diagnosis. Greg, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you very much, Lee. It's great to have you here. Greg, you've lived some widely diverse pursuits in your life. (laughs) Do you suppose they are related somehow to your early NDE? You know, that's the magic of all this for me, Lee. I just kept taking the next right step, and who knew where that was going to take me? (laughs) <laughs> but then in the last couple of years, I just heard this kind of clicking of pieces into place that never fit together before. And a lot of it was a result of, um, you know, I've had a fascination with NDEs all my life from uh, Dr. Moody to Dr. Ben Van Lommel. And uh, I I read that book of Dr. Van Lommel's and it was fascinating Mm-hmm. Then I really started watching videos by like Anthony Cheen and Ions and people's near death listening to your show, near death stories. And I heard this like, oh, these patterns started to make shape in me. And I didn't make much of it. And I'm like, that's kind of how my life was. And that's something that I've done. And I've had that experience or that experience a number of mm-hmm. times. And then all of a sudden, my mind was like, wait a minute, what I saw in the monastery wasn't just some random event that just kind of almost overwhelmed me, but that was a recollection of the near-death experience I had at birth. And then it was like dominoes, like, and I was, then it felt like all these random pieces somehow came together. Yeah. I I think you said that around the age of 10, you uh, were told by your mom that you had almost died at birth. And uh, then, but it didn't really connect you to the, to the event. Well, tell us what how you've recalled this experience now that uh, now that you've been through the vision in the monastery and and thoughts about it since then. Um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting because just the other day, as I was thinking about our dialogue, I I experienced it in a slightly different way. So, um, I was heading out of the monastery, and I had met a woman who was there on retreat. I moved to Houston, became a custom furniture builder, and. Mm-hmm. Um, they kind of prayed over. It was the only monastery in the world at the time in Pecos, New Mexico, where they had men and women in community together. It was the only monastery that the Vatican approved of to have men and women living together. Wow. So, yeah, they, uh, I was heading out. It was like the final mass, and uh, they knew I was leaving that afternoon. So the, the whole community gathered around was praying over me. And it, it's always a rich experience for me to have that happen. But as they were doing that, I saw something, but what just added in the last couple of, like in the last week, literally, was I I remembered almost as if it was happening again, which is what happened when I had the near-death experience. I remembered that it wasn't just seeing things. It's like the space between me and everything else or me and the divine or something bigger just sort of got really thin and I had this experience of seeing this form of awareness to be my mom and this form of awareness or consciousness or soul or whatever you'd like to think of it as. It was me. And then there was this other presence, which was this divine presence. 
And it was just this merging. When I remembered it again last week or so, it was as if I was there again, and there were very little boundaries. I mean, there was a distinction between my mom and me and this divine entity, but like it wasn't a memory anymore, which is how it happened in the monastery, which just kind of surprised the heck out of me. Mm. And what I remembered, it's very simple. There was, there was light, but it was diffuse and real rich. It's not the super bright light that people often talk about, yeah. but the rest of it's really simple. It was my mom basically begging the divine to not take me. And I was off over here going, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't need to be in all of that. Matter of fact, my experience so far has not been very good. Apparently, I I did die of some kind of lung complications or blockage in the throat. Mm. And so I was like happy to be home. And my mom just kept calling me back, I suppose. And, and the divine, that's how it happened. You know, and here I was back in my body, I guess. And here I am talking to you about it <laughs> 69 years later. It's just kind of, it's, I haven't really talked that openly about it. This is all new to me because I just put all the pieces together about a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share it. Oh, of course. Thank you for sharing. D did um, your mom make it clear to you that you you had already been born or was this during the process of giving birth to you that uh, that you died because it can happen at any step along the way and during a birth oh you know that's a good point i think now that i remember it yes th that's a that's a good question i i don't think i've really thought about it like that but she did say to me she said you know we had them they, the priest came in and they baptized you on the spot because you were you know like an adios ball <laughs> and uh so um, apparently I had been born and I wasn't breathing. They couldn't get my throat or my lungs to clear. And they're like, you know, get, get the last rites and send him on his way. Yeah. Wow. As and, a hospital chaplain, I've been called into on situations like that for baptisms. Yeah. Um, and then now you, you were born long before Moody wrote his book. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, this is something that, uh, as with my situation, you know, I had a childhood uh, NDE myself, and and it took me years to figure out what it was all about because nothing had been written. I I didn't find anything until the seventies on the subject, right? And I I guess um, were you in the monastery in in seventy nineteen seventy seven? I think I saw right, yeah, around there. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, but when did you discover Doctor Van Lommel and? Uh, Dr. Grayson and their writings. They're more recent. Dr. Grayson, just in the last uh, eight or nine months, Dr. Van Lomo was, I don't remember how old that book is, but it's its probably in the last five years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that was, it, it's, it's interesting that that information was probably still pretty fresh in me a year and a half or two ago when I started looking at it, these patterns that he sort of identified in his research that distinguished people who have had true NDEs from people that have had, you know, oxygen deprivation or some kind of a, a reaction to, you know, medicine. Yes. And it's, it was fascinating to me. I just ate that up. And uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's, that data was in my mind when I started seeing all this and maybe some part of me was ready to sort of digest it more whole. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I saw this great big gestalt, all these pieces like made this one picture and I was just stupefied. I didn't know quite what to do with it. You mentioned uh, something about a family of light in a closet that you visited at age 10. <laughs> tell, tell us about that. Oh, my goodness. You know, one of the patterns that he talks about, uh, Dr. Van Lommel talks about, mm -hmm. is that the people that have had true NDEs, if they've been religious, and I've been in and out of religion, I've kind of fashioned something that feels true to me now. Um, but like as a little boy, I was at mass every day and I'm going to confession every day. Like I had so many sins to confess at <laughs> nine years old. <laughs> oh, the, the nine-year-old thing in the closet. Yeah. So yes. one of the categories Dr. Van Lommel talks about is a shift out of religion into more kind of spiritual stuff. And I started thinking that as like altruism. And all of a sudden I started thinking about things I did as a kid. And honestly, when I did those things, I just felt like this is the thing for me to do. I, I didn't give it any thought. It was just the next thing. 
But again, when I looked at the pattern a lot, year and a half or two ago, I saw something. I started saying to myself, oh, that may not be something that every kid does. So one of the first things I remember is that I was around nine or I was, I would say nine years old. We lived in this little house, five kids, um, two little bedrooms. We we're all crammed into. And there's this little closet I remember in the hallway. And somehow at nine or 10, I climbed up on the shelf in there and closed the door and sat in the dark for a long time. And I remember talking to a spiritual director one time about that. Somehow I'm like, what, what was that about? And she said to me, she said, you were probably talking to your family of light. You're, and I was like, for sure, totally. You know, like yeah. I didn't buy it at all because I didn't have these pieces put together. But as I let that kind of rumble around in me, it started to make more and more sense. And it's as if there was this still some connection to the divine maybe because I had a near-death experience that I could kind of access some relationship with these support beings outside of me. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing I recognized as this pattern. When I was probably 11 or 12, we moved into another house and there was a family Bible, one of those great big Bibles with the gilded edges, you know, yes. and it sat under a coffee table and just never moved. And I remember when I was, I was probably 12, maybe, Every morning I would sneak out there and get that Bible and bring it into my bedroom, read a passage from Proverbs, run it back out there so nobody would see me. And I would <laughs> kneel up bed for like 45 minutes, like essentially meditating, you know, like I didn't know what meditation was, but I was just sort of digesting that proverb. And then I did it again at night for the same like 30 minutes. And that went on for a year or so. And then when I was, I guess, 15 or so, I started fasting from like Thursday night to Sunday morning on Easter weekend, just fluids. And then I did that the next year. And then after that, I started fasting every weekend, like from Friday night to Sunday night again. Like, and I did that for like a year. Okay, 17-year-olds do that. I don't know. My family didn't say anything about it. And, and that was that. Um, and then when I turned, I guess it was about 20, I became a vegetarian. And I went without red meat for like 37 years. So. I started looking at the whole of that, and I thought, okay, the closet, the meditation, the fasting, the, like, that seems like a thing, you know? So mm. that, that was the kind of the, one of the first patterns I started to kind of glean out of Dr. Van Lummel's work. It's interesting, as a Catholic, as a young Catholic myself, I don't recall hardly any connection at all with the Bible. It was much more a Protestant direction to go in than a, than a yeah. Catholic one. But for you to have fastened on to uh, sneaking the Bible, it's almost like you're reading pornography, <laughs> yeah. oh, stealing stealing the Bible into your room morning and night to meditate on on a line from Proverbs. Curious, like, yeah, like that. that is so curious. Like some part of me didn't feel like it was okay. Like there was, I don't know, it's curious, you're right. Yeah, I, I remember that from, I think the Catholics often, you know, in the Middle Ages opposed the printing of the Bible because they felt it was too much for their congregations for the to understand. You know, I mean, they, you know, the whole story was in stained glass in some of the cathedrals. So they figured that was good enough for the. Oh, my goodness. How for interesting. The, for the masses. But. Oh, wow. And it's interesting, too, that you decided to fast on Easter weekend when everyone else was feasting. I mean, that's the time that turkeys and all of the hams and all of that stuff come out. Well, we did as a family, we fasted on Good Friday. We, you know, we abstained from meat and sure. often fasted between meals. So there was some precedent for that. Yeah. Yes. And we observed, you know, uh, I remember the stations of the cross on Good Friday and, you know, the whole deal. So that was imprinted. So there was a, that was sort of a gift from my family to, mm -hmm. to honor that stuff at the time. And I just kind of I just kept going with it, I suppose. And then I guess you had planned to join or did join the Peace Corps? Yeah, well, that's fascinating. I I, I mean, maybe. I. <laughs> it certainly was a curious event that culminated that whole deal. Yeah, so I joined the, I joined the Peace Corps graduating from college. I literally went out. I, I was in St. Louis at the time. I drove out to, to Colorado and, out, and New Mexico to say goodbye to some of my family. And we had taken all these tests, you know, x-rays, the whole deal. It, you know, the Peace Corps said, you know, okay, we're good. Well, somewhere along the way, the physician that did the x-rays and the testing 
saw something in my lung and he examined it and he said, you know, it's just scar tissue. You should be fine. You just need to get x-rayed every couple of months when you're over in Africa, which is what I was going to put in water wells over there. Oh yeah. And so he sent a letter to the Peace Corps and said, he wants to go and this is fine. He shouldn't have any problems with this lung. And the, the Peace Corps wrote back and said, look, he's not going to get x-rayed every couple of months in the middle of Africa. So they said, yeah, no can do. So that was that. And I was crestfallen, you know. So I moved out to, to Albuquerque and I took up a job in a Sears store busting tires. Eventually, I, I got, it's a whole long story, but I, I was invited to take another job as youth director of a church in Lubbock, Texas. Well, mm. I was cleaning out my tub to get my apartment ready to move. And I coughed something up. I'm like, well, this is weird. And I'm like, well, I spit this out. And it was a bunch of blood. And I started coughing up blood. So mm. I called my brother and his his fiance at the time. I don't think they were married yet. She's a nurse. And they're like, ER. So I went to the ER and uh, basically they said, you've got an egg-sized tumor in your lung. Um, we need to take some tissue from it. So they put me in the, you know, they got me in the OR. And apparently if you've got tubes down your nose and your throat, they can't completely sedate you. So I was conscious and was actually seeing some stuff on the monitor and it was not comfortable. So I was literally kind of throwing people around the ER and they had to bring people in to hold me down. And in the process, my lung collapsed. They got the tissue, ran more tests. Couldn't find it. Well, literally, they had come to pick up my stuff to move me to this new job when I was in the hospital. So as soon as I got out, I drove to Lubbock. And when I got there, I had a new doctor. And he said, uh, you know, I got to start running my own tests. So he did. And, you know, he couldn't figure it out. This went on for like three months. And he's like, I, I, we can't get this. We don't know what it is. So he said, we're going to have to, you know, have you do surgery. And I said, you know, I want to go back home to St. Louis to get the surgery. Let's take a final set of x-rays. Let's push the pause button because yeah. I, six weeks or so before that, in the middle of the night, I was awoken and there was this presence at the end of my bed. It looked like you think things look in the movies. It was kind of vaporous and it was not it's the, this spiritual like, oh, kind of moment. It was like, Get me out of here. Help Mr. Wizard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so came to the side of my bed, and it, it was as if it extended some part of like almost like an appendage over my lung where the, the tumor was. And I felt this pinching in there, just like I felt when they excised part of the, the, the tissue. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's like six weeks before these last set of x-rays. The priest, the 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 at the priest, the uh doctor, this really great big Texas dude with a real high voice. And he called me at work and I'm like, yeah, what's going on? I go, great. You got your very miracle. And tumor was gone and has never come back. I had to, of course, get x-rayed for a couple of years after that and have had other x-rays in my body. I'm like, take the screen down and check my lung a little bit while you're there. Hmm. Never come back. Wow. But that being that you saw didn't identify themselves to you or or say they were going to heal you no i asked the abbot about it in the monastery and mm -hmm. his take on it was it could have been a soul that needed a little help essentially to like move like step farther into the light maybe th that wor those weren't his words but those are my words and it was kind of an act of compassion for you so i'm like okay i i you know wow i no don't know that's don't know that souls have that kind of ability. Angels do. Ah. That, you know, that sounds, it seems to me more like someone who's come down specifically for that. Oh. They, they saw you were headed in the right direction and wanted to make sure you'd be healthy doing it. Wow. Thank you. I'm, I'm very interested if you have more to say about that. The, the angels work in that way. Yeah. Well, when did you uh, decide to join the Benedictine monastery? Tell us about what life was like there. Life there was very healing, just a, a lot of love. And I think that's what I went for. I just soaked it up like a sponge. And my spiritual director was a woman. It's interesting because we started doing dream work together. And I wound up doing my master's thesis on dreams and have done a lot of dream work with clients over the years and groups. That even uh, Yes, it, it was supportive and lots of wisdom. People came from all over the world to come there for like weekend retreats or individual week-long, month-long retreats. 
And like I said, I've, I've kind of built a little pottery back in this off building and then started doing pottery for the gift shop there. Um, everybody had a job, which is classic Benedictine stuff. You know, you work with your hands yes. to kind of clear the mind. Um, worked, I think. And I started playing music there. I mean, I had started playing the guitar when I was 14 or 15, but they they had a little group that they played for people that came for these group retreats every once in a while. I was like every couple of months, we'd have a group in for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I started playing a little bit of music there. It was all religious music. The place was nourishing. And I think the woman I met was my ticket out, but I think it was more about there was something that I needed emotionally, psychologically. It was like too safe almost. It was, it was almost like a rebirth, you know? I, I was loved, I was cared for, I felt supported, respected. And yet there were parts of me, like I've kind of been not real social for a lot of my life. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I stayed there, that wasn't going to change. I wasn't developing the kind of social skills, if you will, and kind of a level of emotional maturity that I lacked, that I wasn't going to get that there. So I'm like, I got to go. So eventually I, I, off I went to Houston. Yeah. Now, was it after that that you got your master's and, yes. and, and wrote that thesis? Now, all I know about your thesis is the title, but it's intriguing. It's Dreaming, Mystery or Mastery. Tell us what you uh, wrote about. So I became enchanted with the Gestalt approach to dream work. And it's the principal style that I use. I still think there can be spiritual experiences in dreams. And if somebody comes to me, it's like, let's go there. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of the Native American stuff about animal medicine. If somebody has repeated dreams of an animal, we look at what the natives say the, the, the spirit of the animal is, and that's powerful in its own way. But the fundamental Gestalt approach is that all parts of the dreams represent some part of the self. And that in Gestalt work, we, you've heard of the empty chair technique. We have the client move to an empty chair and take on a character. It could be a person. It could be a thing. It could be an animal. I can tell you a story of an experience I did with a, an older woman on a, a live radio show. I did a little dream work with her if you're interested. But sure. the Gestalt approach is everything you see in a dream represents some part of you. And we give that part a voice and we start to have the conscious self dialogue literally with that part that's come up in this dream symbol. And so my research was to try to validate that. And in fact, it did, especially with women. So I gave people uh, a tool that was a valid tool to score or rate their sense of self, like a self-concept tool. And it gives you a sense of how well they're in relationship with themselves. And so if it's true that the dreams represent all parts of the dreams represent some part of the self. If we have a lot of dreams that have really wonderful symbols, then there's going to be a relationship with self that reflects that. The converse is true. If our relationship with self is compromised, our dream is going to be reflecting that. And it found that people essentially, and it was statistically significant, especially with women, that if you had a really good sense of self, there were lots of positive symbols that you gave a positive association to in your dreams. If the self-construct tool identified a compromised sense of self, then there were lots of symbols in the dreams that the dreamer had a negative association to. So that's essentially it. Mm. Now, in the Bible that you used to borrow, mornings and nights, there are lots of stories about the prophecy that came to the writers of the Bible in dreams, like Jacob's dream in Bethel of, of the ladder that went up to heaven and angels walking up and down on it. When you were doing this dream study, did you encounter people who'd had spiritual dreams or have you had them yourself? I can't remember, Lee, anyone coming to me with a dream that felt particularly spiritual. I personally think they all are. They're part of who we are. And we are, I believe, holy beings, um, all of us. Um, but I have had spiritual dreams. I've had dreams where, I mean, the one that's coming to mind, there are two. One is a dream of my sister who died. And just a visit with her, like just this glow, like both of us just alive in this beautiful connection. And it was just like a, hey, I'm okay. And and I'm so happy, like profound, you know, like that felt, that was, that went outside any theory, you know, put your theories down. That is not <laughs> the same thing. And it's wonderful. And I also had a couple of dreams where they felt almost shamanistic, 
one of them in particular, I was in this cave and I saw these people, these, I think they were primarily men, but they were like, like shape-shifting almost. And like, but it, it was just, I woke up from that. I'm like, oh man, that is not your typical dream. There's something going on there. <laughs> I, I felt like they were like a rhythm of support for me. It was, it was wonderful. Some people have dreams that they feel connect them with past lives. And they'll dream of something that's never happened to them in this life, but feels so real to them that yes. they assume that they went through it during a previous lifetime. That's a whole nother category. You know, the studies they've done with, with children that have like very explicit experiences and they start tracking down names and stuff they remember, and they're like, oh my goodness, mm. how did he or she know about that event that happened, you know, 78 years ago and the child's like, you know, five. It's just, yeah. that's a whole thing. I've done, I think, three shows on child dreams. And it's so, they're, oh. these are so easy to collect because someone will tweet something or uh, put something out into the, the social media. And immediately mothers and fathers are reporting, you know, as comments, mm. well, my child, did this, you know, my child talked about when he was the father and and I was his daughter and, you know, they'll, they'll reverse the roles of the family. They'll talk about, well, one that stays in my mind is really almost scary is uh, this mother who found her five-year-old in a hallway crying, weeping. And she said, did you have a bad dream? She said, no, I, I just remembered when I was a bad dog and they had to put me down. Oh, you know, <laughs> And, you know, and then I guess after that, she'd cried herself out and never talked about it again. My goodness. You know, so there's even that kind of animal human connection, which I some... don't think I've heard of that before. My gosh. Yeah. So then you what got you into the psychoanalysis part of your life? I mean, practicing, not going through it yourself. Yeah. Well, this is when I was in Houston as a cabinet maker. And I, I was just really loving that work. I mean, to take boards and fashion them into a you know cabinet or bedroom set it's just powerful and rich and nourishing and yet i guess about a year and a half into it there was this little voice that just it's like there's more there's something else i'm not sure what it is but it's kind of like that hmm. and i was making you know i think i was probably making like this is back in 1978 79 was when I, you know, I started questioning, was this really my path? And honestly, I, I loved it. And I was making 25 bucks an hour and I never imagined I'd make 25 bucks an hour. You know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> I can't leave this. And I remember my dad, he's, he's, he's come through in moments with these statements of brilliance that uh, are really simple, but like really met the need. I remember calling him up and I was a little sheepish. It's like, you know, dad, I'm doing pretty good. And, and I'm making pretty good money. And he just listened. And I said, but I don't think I'm done. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I feel like I'm being sort of called to do something else. I don't know what to do. And he just said, nobody ever said you had to do anything forever. And there was something because, you know, my parents, you know, like post-depression and, and went through some of that. And so it's like stability is really important. And for him to, 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 to speak that to me, really loosened me up. And I know what a gift. Know, <laughs> yes, truly. You know, and I'm signing up for school and, you know, back working on my master's degree. Huh. In uh, the notes that you sent, there was a time when you said some prayers for people that, and they reported a, a illumination and healing following the prayer. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Was this much after I mean, I don't, I don't know, have a timeline. Yeah, that uh, was, uh, those both happened in the last, I'd say five or six years. You know, this for me fell into the category of spiritually transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the people that have had NDEs apparently have a propensity for uh, kind of these kind of spiritual experiences that are kind of curious and remarkable, you know, to some. So working with a spiritual director, she, she helped me, develop this prayer form. It's a long story, but it was sort of a meditation process where I would pray for people, but it was really like I had created in 
my mind's eye like a temple or a chamber or a center. For me, it was like beings of light that were there to support the prayer. And I would invite people in my mind. Sometimes I would just do it like, I know this sounds like trippy, but like intuitively invite someone into the chamber. And if intuitively it seemed like they were open to it, then I would just allow them in and I would kind of let these beings of light do their work. And then Mm. often for physical stuff, but it could be emotional stuff too. So I was working with someone and didn't tell this person that I was doing this. I just kind of invited this person in and this person accepted the invitation. And this person was really struggling. And uh, basically, this is just this place filled with light and love and healing. And really, like, when when I go there myself, it feels therapeutic and healing to me. Um, And then there was another person, this is a family member that I invited. And and I told this person, you know, uh, this is something that I do. Are you interested? And this person said, yeah. Well, that person that knew what I was, they didn't know what the kind of the, 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 what happened in there. They knew it was a place that I put people, invited them in. And that person, like the day after, or three or four days after, texted me and said, you said you were going to be praying for me. I felt this euphoria like I've never felt before. And I felt this peace come over me and really powerful. The other person that had no idea that I was doing it, when I saw that person, like in the week since I last seen that person, the person reported something I'd never heard this person ever talk about before. Mm-hmm. The person said, I was surrounded by light and love like I was up in the clouds and unlike anything I've ever felt before. And it just really calmed me down and it made me feel really good. And I never, that person to this day doesn't know what I had done. It doesn't matter. But for me, it just was another piece in putting the pieces together about the stuff that Dr. Van Lomo speaks of. Mm. Wow. To jump back to the monastery, uh, you had said something about seeing dramatic colors around virtually everything during a walk around the monastery grounds. Yeah. That sounds quite trippy. What what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> it was quite trippy. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. My sister, Jean, loved the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's one of the songs I did my own version of. Everything else is original. There are colors in the movie The Wizard of Oz that oh, are yes. just like iridescent, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and like sometimes when you drive down the highway, if there's like oil on the road and it's been raining or there's a lot of heat, you'll see these purples and lavenders and greens and yellows coming up. That's the movies, the, the colors in the movie uh, Wizard of Oz and the, and the colors that you see like in a mirage or coming off the highway like that. That's the closest description I can give for them. They're radiant and they're, they, imbue whatever it is that they're, it's not just around them it's in them and on them and through them and it just like 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 waves coming off uh and i was just like stupefied and then one other time it happened this is really curious well i've in my my energy work with people i've seen like the, you know they talk about the etheric field around the body and i can see oftentimes when i work with people like this yellow very thin sort of veil of yellow around the body, sometimes blue. Um, there was one time with my dad. I was in the backyard talking to him. This is odd. And he was cleaning off the air conditioner and the fans were spinning. And he was, you know, blowing water down in there. And I'm standing next to him talking to him. And I do a double take. And I'm like, do you see that, Dad? And he looked at me kind of cross-eyed. And he saw where I was looking. He goes, see what? And it was those moments where it was another little sample of it. And then there's one other time, well, two other times that I saw light around people. And again, this is, this is us. This is the human being. This is not me. This is all of us. This is what we're about. This is natural. Um, I was working 
at this center for uh, people that had cancer. And uh, there was a kitchen there and I walked into the kitchen and I saw this guy and I knew he was really ill. And uh, he was had his back to him. He was doing something over one of the counters. And I remember looking over at him and there was just this light coming off of him. And I just put my hand on his shoulder and say, how you doing? Well, he died like the next week. And strangely enough, within that same week, all places I was sitting in McDonald's having a fish fillet, <laughs> and there was a baby in a pumpkin seat on the floor. And I'm doing my thing, dipping my fries, whatever. And I look over, and this baby is lit up. I'm like, and what went through my mind, Lee, was, oh, the veil between this place and that place Maybe it gets really thin as we approach death and as we leave it and are coming into life. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, um, so many people who've had near-death experiences describe walking through gardens where the flowers and the trees are just radiating this light. And I think probably St. Francis, among others, have seen it in just the nature that we live with, too, because it's happening all the time, all around. Yes. It's just that we're so, our brains don't like to acknowledge it at all. It's it's our souls that respond to it. You're here. Yeah, but uh, but that's exactly the way gardens and on the other side are described. The flowers just, um, a woman named Christine I interviewed a couple of weeks ago was talking about the flowers that she saw on the other side, and it's just just what you were talking about walking around the monastery grounds. I get, I got to see Kimberly Sharp, Clark, Clark Sharp speak recently and her description just made me laugh out loud. <laughs> she's funny. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read her book or seen her, she's remarkable. Oh um, yes. I've seen her at IONS conferences. Yeah. Yeah. That's where she was. And she said, when I was over there, blue wasn't, Blue, it was blue. And she said, the grass wasn't green, it was green. <laughs> I know, it's uh, the platonic essence of green, greenness. It's not just yes. ordinary green. It is, it is the, it's the essence of green. Wow. Now, uh, there was another experience that you reported uh, about um, experience, uh, experiencing a sense of hurling through space. Oh, yeah, Tell I us know about there are people. That. There may be family members and stuff that hear this, and they're like, "Who is this guy?" Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't know. There's like, I'm really not talking about this much. If they're if they're listening to this show, you're right up their alley. <laughs> our, <laughs> our, our listeners will love it. Okay, I, I hope it speaks to someone. Um, yeah, it was when the, it was in the monastery. Now it did happen once or twice after I left. I don't know if there's some kind of a presence or a kind of an energy a healing force that kind of accumulates in certain places and that's why i've had these experiences there i have had them elsewhere but really really kind of concentrated there so several times not several two or three times when i was kind of meditating to go to bed and i remember one time distinctly i was laying in bed and i was in this kind of prayerful state and it was like everything started to shake me the be I mean, I know I sound crazy. It's okay. I mean, this is just what's happened to me. <laughs> People can tell me I'm nuts or, you know, it's fine. I know what happened to me. Uh, I accept it. But everything was quickened. And all of a sudden, it was like, honest to goodness, you know, like in Star Wars, where it's like warp speed, Scotty, and you're like, hurry, you're like going through the stars like a million miles an hour. Mm. That's what it was like. And I was just blown away. It sounds like a pun, but that's what it was. And then I didn't know what to do with that. And I left the monastery. And several years later, there was a Tibetan monk at Washington University here in St. Louis speaking. And I'm like, I just felt like I need to go listen to this gentleman. So I did. He spoke no English, but he had an interpreter that he you know, spoke through. And I waited for everybody else to kind of go up and meet him after the presentation and you know, chat, and I was like keeping in the background, and the final everybody else was gone. I walked up to him, and I'm kind of looking around, like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. And I said to the interpreter, I had this experience. I've had it a couple times, and I don't know. This sounds a little bit. Now I feel like I'm talking about. This feels a little egocentric, to tell you the truth. I don't know if it's necessary. 
Go ahead. I, I mean, I think people are uh, understand. So I asked the interpreter, I told him what happened. I said, what do I make of that? And all this Tibetan monk from, you know, the Himalayas, all he said was, through the interpreter, very advanced. So I've had to work with my ego. But what that did was, it was a confirmation of something that was another one of these random pieces that I didn't have any place to put. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, perhaps I needed that to just take the next right step. And so it was nourishing to me. And I'm glad I asked him. Yes. Wow. You mentioned in your notes too that, and this is very common among people who've had near-death experiences that you didn't fear death. And I, I thought to myself, looking at that photograph of you on doing motocross, <laughs> <laughs> it was readily apparent that you didn't fear death doing that. Do, do you suppose this that your NDE though gave you some uh, additional confidence to do things like that and and combat? You know, you you were also the into the karate. Oh, yeah. You know, my family's pretty athletic. My dad was a, a pro baseball player when he was young, but he had to quit because couldn't, they were only making like 25 bucks a week when he played for the St. Louis Browns. He's like, I, I got to raise a family. So he quit. <laughs> so the family's pretty athletic, all of us. So that comes with the genes, I think. And I appreciate that because I've enjoyed that part of my life a lot. One of the things that Dr. Grayson says about that, he said, people that have had near-death experiences, they're not afraid of death, then okay, well, that makes sense. But he also says they're not afraid of life. And I was like, that just happened about a month ago that I put that piece in. I'm like, mm. oh my goodness, like, like the house that I'm living in is made out of seven shipping containers. And I basically put life savings in to make this happen. It's a long story. In the end, it's working out wonderfully, but it was a huge risk. Um, and one of the things Dr. Grayson says is, they're not afraid of life, and they're not afraid to lose everything. I came very close to losing everything with this house. Doing this interview, talking about these things, trying to step back out there with my music, that feels like that's the kind of risk that I suspect that my NDEE -E sort of sponsors in me. Those are the kinds of directions with my life. Like I started my private practice and you're supposed to have, you know, like two years of money saved so that if things don't go right, you, you know, you can take care of yourself. Yeah. I had like six months and I was charging hardly anything to develop a practice. And that practice just ended in, in as an LPC like last year. And, you know, so it was over 20 years. So starting it was like just stepping off a cliff, but and, you know, I could have gotten into a really tough spot, but I didn't. And so I think those are the places that and and I, I believe because of the support that my spirit was given through the songs. When I listen to those those songs now, I hear them infused with themes that any ears talk about all the time. And, and I didn't know that stuff, but the songs were coming through and they were making me feel better. So I wrote it down, like those are the places where the NDE, you know, the patterns of my life, the professional choices I've made reflect it. But I think those are the places I think I see it most. You know, musicians, when they come back from a near-death experience, often report having heard amazing music on the other side, the angels singing and beautiful harmonies yes. and all of those early visions of angels sitting on clouds playing harps, I guess there's something like that actually going yeah. on. And music is, is I've always thought of it, and then I have no talent in music. Well, I've done some singing, but, but basically no real musical ability. But I've often thought of it as being, you know, one of those dimensional links that we have with the other side that can continue, as I said before we started the show, it's such a powerful tool for dealing with Alzheimer's. Yeah. and dementia because people remember those songs and are enabled while they're hearing you know what frank sinatra or something in the background mm -hmm. suddenly they're able to converse again with a son or a daughter or a grandchild or whatever yes music so has a way of going places that the spoken word cannot yeah well if people want to hear some of your music tell us how um they could do that 
Sure. There are some uh, sound clips on my website, which is gregpacinimusic.com, G-R-E-G-P-A-C-I-N-I music.com. And I'd love to share this music with people. You know, if folks want me to come to them or do it virtually, I, I'd just be honored. I just want to, I told somebody else, I'm not interested in likes and clicks. I'm interested in wholeness and healing. Yeah. Where are you located, Greg? I'm in uh, just across the river from St. Louis in a small town between Jerseyville and uh, Godfrey, Illinois. Okay. Just a little bit up from Alton, Illinois. And you said that you were uh, for a while or maybe now the only white member of an, in a large gospel choir. Yeah. That would be such a rich experience, I would think. That's the word. That is the word. Yeah, I left, you know, I was not practicing Catholicism and I'm I'm not practicing Catholicism now. So be it. It's it's given me wonderful things and still is giving some people wonderful things. But I had been out of the church for many, many years and I heard about this church that was predominantly black. Somehow it just felt right. And I went down there one Easter and I'm like, it's an old cathedral, dramatically beautiful cathedral. Hmm. And there was this huge choir loft in the back, but the choir was on the altar. So, and there was drums and horns and uh, rows of choir members and a piano, and it was just wonderful. I didn't know how wonderful it was going to be, so I went up in the in the loft. I was the only person up there, and I watched this whole thing. And they started singing, and I was just like, "Whoa!" And I got drawn in. And eventually, I went up to the to the choir director, and I said, "You know, I, I kind of now on this this particular choir." I was not the only uh, white guy. There were some white men and women in this choir, you know, maybe eight of us and maybe 30 or 40 black members. But then there was the the gentleman that that ran the choir for the earlier mass, did a mass choir. Where we just got a bunch of people together. And on the back of the CD, he got my name wrong, but there's one white face and like 50 black faces. And oh my gosh. It is really hard to put into words what it feels like to be making these sounds with all these people. It is, it it, it just takes me away. It is, ooh, we. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I wish lots and lots of people who are out there buying their AR-15s could experience that kind of sharing. I think they, they would take a lot of the heat out of our current society. Well said. Yeah. I have to ask you, and this is a little to the side, but how do you put seven containers together to make a house? <laughs> They're side by side. Yeah. Okay. They're not stacked. It's not like a... Uh-uh. It's one floor. <laughs> yeah. Two smaller ones for the garage and then five for the house and the long one of them is 45. The others are 40. And it looks out over the land, the longer one. I thought maybe it would be like a, a monastery design where you have a garden in the middle and have it just go around in, in a rectangle. You know, that's not a bad idea. I had strange, <laughs> I did have thoughts about a garden like like one of those live roofs, you know, mm -hmm. where you have plants on the roof and stuff because of the metal containers. But I had lots of different ideas going around before I kind of <laughs> came up with a design. How did you come up with that? What made you think of building a house that way? You know, I've had this land, I was... I live in the woods. I've got this property and it's just a, maybe there'll be a day that it'll be something that people can come and experience. I knew when I bought it, that this is not just for me. So I don't know what that's going to turn into, but it's 40 acres of pristine woods. Mm. I was able to buy it through. It's one I used to see Sid talked about getting a kiss on the top of the head from God. And the way this came down that I was able to buy the land 30 some years ago, was like, I got a kiss on the top of the head from God <laughs> where I'm sitting right now. If I lean over and look, about 75 yards away, there is a waterfall that's about 45 feet across and 45 feet down. Oh, and wow. Design the house to sit here. I've had this for a long time. I almost sold it. It fell through. I was going to move to Colorado. And then I'm like, well, maybe there's a way I can live on that property. And I started looking online at different ways to build homes that were reasonable, given what I wanted. And, uh, I did a lot of the work myself, but, you know, I've had contractors help and this is where I'll probably finish out my life. I, I mean, I, I have animals 
all over the place. I mean, the birds are eating out of my hand now, and that's how I came up with it. Yeah. The uh, post office had a recent issue of stamps portraying waterfalls in different parts of the country. Mm. And I bought out, <laughs> I like them oh. so much, I bought all the sheets in our local post office. Oh, my goodness. Are you a big <laughs> fan of the waterfall? Uh, yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. So well, you and your family would be welcome anytime, Lee. Oh, well, I'd love to see it. Uh, and I'd love, love to see, I, you know, I've built my own house too, but oh, wow. more traditional style than yours. I'd love to see it done with containers like that. I have seen a house that was made out of a railroad car and that turned out pretty uh -huh. well. Yeah. It's so a very it's just, similar idea. Yeah. Just, it was just one railroad car though. It didn't have that much uh, room in it, but it was just one person. So that worked out. Gets the job done. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Well, listen, in the couple of minutes we've got left, tell us about the books that you wrote, Journey Beyond Hardship and Journey Beyond Diagnosis. When I left that organization that provided free psychosocial support, it's now called uh, the Cancer Support Community. It was then called the Wellness Community. And mm -hmm. they do a lot of really good work. When I left there and started my own practice, it wasn't long before I went, you know what? Those people taught me so much. I mean, I was leading groups and doing individual work and programming for these folks. You know, many got better, some didn't, and I was with them in the dying process. That there, there is very few things in life that will heal you and, and help you on your way like that will. And I just knew, like, this information is it's got to be taken out of me. And I wrote the first book, Journey Beyond Diagnosis. Um, Dr. Uh, Peter Weiss, who is brother of the acclaimed psychiatrist Brian Weiss, wrote the foreword for my first book. Nice. And then the second book is Journey Beyond Hardship. It's very similar to the first, but it's broadened out, not just if you're dealing with a chronic disease, if you're dealing with, um, you know, a natural disaster, financial trouble, divorce, um, uh, all of those matters, hardship of any kind. You know, so many people right now are dealing with hardship. We've had natural, it's, it's we've got wars going on. God help us. Um, the book is designed to do that. It's designed to help. And it basically uses the metaphor of taking, taking a journey to describe the process of just finding out to getting better at the end. Um, and Anita Morjani, who you've probably heard of, she wrote the foreword for my second book. Oh, yes. Maybe in hardship. She's been to many IONS conferences herself. Yes. So remarkable story for, from Anita as well. It is. It is. Well, Greg, thank you so much for doing the show. I think this is going to be fascinating to people for, on a number of different levels because it's been such a widely uh, experienced life that you've reported on here. Well, thank, I hope so, Lee. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it's an honor. You've done so much for so many. I am grateful for you and your work. Well, it's because people are willing to come on and, and talk about their experiences. If people would, especially NDEers, but anyone who's had a spiritually transformative experience, I'll, I've said this before, but I'll say it again, to share those experiences is such a gift to the rest of us. And it's such a healing thing as well, because suddenly, you know, people see beyond their own little circle the to the larger picture and the fact that we are all one ultimately is the is the outcome that could could come from everyone if they would share just like you have today so oh, i yes, thank sir. you i, I thank oh, you. you are welcome i so much support the notion that yes we are all one and that's what quickened in me watching those ndes that helped me put it all together so yeah. right on with that so good luck with your music uh thank you, sir. i'll be uh listening to the top 40 waiting to hear from Greg Pashini. <laughs> have you done any rap? You know, I did have one little song. It was a funky little tune. I never really played it publicly, but, you know, I found myself messing with that a little bit. <laughs> it's mostly folk kind of jazz, contemporary jazz kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But with these spiritual themes. Yep. Well, it sounds great. I'll get on your website and listen to it myself. Excellent. Well, thank you to Greg Pashini for sharing his story with us today. Please check out his website. Greg, tell us the website again. GregPashiniMusic.com. And there's a link to the books there. There's a, a link on uh, for the Journey Beyond Hardship as well. Excellent. 
So to hear his music and to get his books. And if you'd like to hear this show again, or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on a complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening. <laughs>